Would you all please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mr. Barrett? Here. Mr. D'Andriano? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Griffin? Here. Uh, first item on our agenda this evening is a presentation by the uh, Patterson Fire Department. This time I would invite uh, Chief Spindler up to the microphone, please. Good evening. Uh, Matt Spindler, uh, Chief of Patterson Fire Department. Uh, we were here a few weeks ago and uh, discussed uh, some possible changes to, uh, to EMS. Um, after a couple of uh, lengthy meetings with uh, the town and with uh, our department and our department attorney, uh, we uh, certainly can uh, appreciate the uh, fiscal constraints of the town. Uh, and so we started looking for some alternatives uh, that we might be able to uh, provide at least as good a service as the proposal that we offered before, uh, possibly better service, uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, keeping in mind the, uh, you know, the uh, tough target of the budget. So, um, we wanted to, uh, and I believe you guys have all had a copy of the, uh, the proposal, right, from, uh, from the town. So, uh, anyway, basically, um, at, at some point here in the, uh, in the future, uh, probably on or about uh, June 30, uh, Button Lake Fire Department, um, it's their intention to, uh, to cease uh, ambulance transport service and to uh, move into cert excuse me, certified first responder um, uh, delivery. Uh, at that point, uh, the Patterson Fire Department would uh, assume full responsibility for uh, EMS transport services and we will continue, uh, as we currently do in the evenings, providing a duty crew uh, of a trained EMT, uh, driver ambulance, um, and, and there would be a couple nights a week, two or three nights a week, that uh, that duty crew would be supplemented by uh, Transcare, um, which would be contracted uh, by the town. Um, we uh, discussed with Transcare, and we're still in uh, talks with them, about uh, the best uh, method uh, and, and the most cost-effective method for providing that supplemental staffing. Uh, it appears um, at this point that it would probably be cheaper uh, for them to, to provide two EMTs to staff our ambulance uh, as opposed to them providing an ambulance uh, of their own uh, and, and staffing it that way. Um, Despite the uh, the offset of the uh, you know, billing revenue from uh, from Transcare uh, by using their ambulance, uh, the vast majority of the calls uh, that Patterson and Putnam Lake uh, District see uh, is during the hours of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., which uh, you know is already being covered. Um, so, uh, but but with the added cost of the vehicle and the insurance. Uh, and everything else would, would probably make it uh, probably make it more cost effective for them to just provide two EMTs to staff our ambulance. Um, we would we would continue that uh, at such time uh, probably for uh, uh, at least five or six months. Um, in, at which point we would be looking to uh, create a separate not-for-profit corporation uh, that would provide uh, EMS services for the town of Patterson. Uh, both Patterson and Putnam Lake Fire Districts. Um, the not-for-profit corporation obviously would have the uh, ability to bill, so the cost of the operation would be offset by billing revenue. Um, however, um, the anticipated uh, costs and the anticipated billing revenue uh, under this proposal that, that you guys have before you uh, would provide uh, enough uh, resources to staff um, four, uh, four personnel, five during the day, uh, but four personnel 24-7, two firefighter EMTs, and two uh, firefighter certified first responders as drivers. 
Uh, and, and essentially what that will allow us to do is it will allow us to staff uh, two ambulances for two simultaneous uh, EMS runs, or uh, it would enable us also uh, to provide supplemental staffing to the volunteer fire department as the, uh, the employees would be uh, participating in, in what we discussed before, the 209I program, where they would essentially be uh, volunteering and providing staffing uh, on the fire department side uh, for any fire calls uh, as well. Um, so, and, and, and the original uh, the proposal that you have before you there, uh, basically um, the cost of that uh, uh, program uh, would essentially be the same or slightly less uh, for four or five people 24-7 than it would be for the original proposal, which was Transcare providing an ambulance with two EMTs 24-7 uh, to do EMS only. Uh, Matt, how, uh, how, if you're talking about, uh, you're gonna, as of July uh, 1st, you want to hire, you want the town to hire two uh, Transcare workers and put them in your ambulance. How's the billing gonna be accomplished with that? Well, if the, uh, again, uh, and, and the preliminary discussions that we have with Rob Stuck from Transcare, uh, it, it appears that it's more cost effective uh, because of the added cost of, of their ambulance, the insurance, et cetera, um, that even though uh, they could bill if they used their ambulance, the added costs make it uh, more beneficial for them to just staff our ambulance. And there would be no billing at that point. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, you the cost the cost uh, approximately for uh, two nights of coverage um, would would be around twenty five hundred dollars, a little over twenty five hundred dollars a month, um, and for three nights would be uh, approximately thirty nine hundred dollars a month. Okay. And then you talked about a, a when you implement in in the future, if if we were to implement the plan where you would have the DMTs and the, the firefighters, you talked about having a second ambulance crew. Where are we getting the second ambulance from? Uh, we currently uh, have money allocated in our vehicle replacement fund to replace the ambulance that we currently have. So we would look to uh, to purchase another ambulance, um, either either a new or used vehicle, and, and place the, the, the ambulance that we have now in reserve status. So. Uh, obviously, if there was a need for a second ambulance, uh, that would be the one that would uh, would respond. If the primary ambulance uh, had to go out for uh, you know maintenance, routine oil change, etc., uh, we'd have a second ambulance there to uh, to back that up. Okay. Uh, any board members have any questions at this time? Okay. Well, uh, I just wanted to say also <clears throat> when we talked about the budget, and I spoke to uh, to Trish. <coughs> um, I didn't have uh, the, uh, I do not believe I have the, uh, the total tariff valuation for, for 2015 yet. Uh, I don't know, it's probably not finalized, I guess, right till, uh, till May. But um, in, in the years past, uh, the, the, the town uh, budget for fire and EMS protection was approximately $1.4 million, mm -hmm. and the village was 1.166 per thousand um, to uh, to staff this uh, proposal the way we have it laid out for you guys uh, this evening. Uh, the total cost would be approximately 1.7 million dollars, which would increase the millage to about 1.427 uh, per thousand. Um, and we did some uh, you know, preliminary calculations based upon uh, the average assessed values of, of certain homes. Um, and it, it works out to be, uh, you know, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $100, $150 extra a month, uh, or I'm sorry, a month, uh, a year. Uh, so certainly for less than a dollar a day, uh, we're going to have 24-7 staffing for both fire and EMS, uh, four or five people supplemented by, uh, you know, the volunteers. Uh, just to give you a little comparison, uh, Mayapac, uh, which is a part of the town of Carmel, a uh, uh, fire district in the town of Carmel. Um, last year, uh, or I should say this year, 2014, 
their adopted budget is, is approximately $2.1 million at a millage of uh, 1.74. Uh, so uh, certainly the, uh, you know, the uh, increase that we're looking for in the tax rate um, and the additional revenue to fund fire and EMS uh, under this proposal uh, is, is certainly less than, than what Mayapac is right now for all volunteer fire and EMS. Um, and it's certainly in line with a lot of our neighboring jurisdictions. Uh, Pauling and Beekman up in Dutchess County, uh, they're also uh, you know, similar in terms of uh, the millage and the, uh, and the total budget uh, at, at, at less population. You, you may have told us last time, but what was Maypac doing? What, what's, what are they? Uh, is that is that Carmel Ambulance Maypac, or is that a separate ambulance company for Maypac? Uh, Maypac provides uh, Maypac Fire Department provides both fire and EMS protection for the Maypac Fire District. As a volunteer, yeah. all, all, it's all volunteers. So Transcare, they have no Transcare. No, no. Other, other than the, the uh, paramedic service okay. from, from the county. From the county, right? Okay. Thank you. Any questions? All right, well, we have a lot to think about, and uh, certainly uh, we have some more conversations. I know that uh, there's been some conversations at the county level with TransCare also regarding uh, the possibility of doing this at slightly larger scope, um, but I'm not sure how soon that's. Well, the, the county, TransCare has offered to put more ambulances and, and more staffing in the county, and actually at a reduced cost. The, the part of the thing, issue is, that that would mean that the volunteers have to stop, stand out from doing transports because that's the only thing that TransCare really makes any serious money on is doing the trans transports. They, they do some billing for showing up, but the bulk of the money that they make is from doing the transports. transports. Mm -hmm. What happens now is if they're on the scene and, and a volunteer ambulance corps shows up, they do the transport, TransCare gets, basically gets nothing. So. They're willing to do more, but it would take a cooperative process uh, throughout the county from the uh, volunteers to make that work. The other downside to that, though, that people have to keep in mind is TransCare would do uh, essentially hard billing. So if you got a bill for $750, you're going to have to pay that. Now, most of the time, your insurance will cover what the bill is, but if, if for some reason it doesn't, you're still going to be obligated. So. Uh, one of the advantages with the, the volunteer fire departments doing it is, is they're legally not allowed to bill, but TransCare can bill you for pretty much anything they want. So I know when my dad went to the hospital, you guys came out and um, and then TransCare showed up, and then TransCare went in your ambulance with him to the hospital. The paramedic. The paramedic, right? Yeah. So under that scenario, assuming you were an independent, I know you, you can't bill, but assuming that was an independent or non for profit. What? Non-for-profit. Could TransCare they, bill they in that instance? Bill, they would still bill for the paramedic services. So even though you're, they're going in your ambulance, it's right. paramedic services they're providing the a higher level okay. of service than the... Uh, gotcha. Now, I, I would also like to add um, that uh, as far as the, um, you know, as far as the county goes, um, and we've had conversations with them uh, as, as recently as last week, um, they, they continue to tell us that there is uh, uh, no anticipation of, of expanding from what they have now. They're waiting for the uh, confirmation of a new commissioner of emergency services, uh, and, and the county executive would not even entertain discussion of changing anything with the EMS uh, services uh, until after the commissioner was uh, appointed. You know, appointed and confirmed. But well, he's already been appointed, I guess. Um, Actually, they tabled it, so. That might be a while until he's appointed. Yeah. So, and I know, I know, in having uh, discussions, uh, the county fire chiefs association. Uh, she was a guest speaker uh, last year, I believe, sometime, and, and we heard rumors that uh, the county was looking to get out of EMS altogether. Hmm. Um, and, and we asked her about that. She she said that was not the case, um, but uh, you know, we continue to hear those rumors. So uh, I don't know that we're gonna. As much as as much as we think it would be uh, wise down the road as a gold standard to look for uh, you know county uh, county wide fire and EMS system, um, 
I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. I think the word is that there's declining sales taxes and they're having problems with their budget too. So that's probably well, right. I, I think any governmental entity is going to have problems with their budgets these days, especially considering, you know, the two percent tax cap, which you know, three million dollar increase in our budget is going to obliterate our tax cap and uh, probably take out of the, any any possibility of anybody getting additional checks from the state. But uh, I think it's pretty clear that as of July 1st, we're on our own. Mm -hmm. And we have to solve our problems within our town borders. So. Now, the other thing I want to add, uh, there is le uh, legislation pending uh, that's being championed by uh, FASNI, which is the uh, Fireman's Association of the State of New York, um, to, uh, I forget exactly what the name of the, of the bill was, but they're basically looking to uh, equalize um, volunteer ambulance scores are allowed to uh, bill volunteer fire departments or not. Um, and, and there seems to be a, an inequity there that nobody seems to be able to explain why one can do it and the other one can't. Um, I, I haven't spoken to anybody from FASNI. I, I don't know what the chances are of that legislation passing. Uh, my understanding is that it's been uh, in the works for at least 10 to 15 years, and we seem to be uh, at, a, at an impasse for some reason about trying to get that pushed over the hump. So, um, but as I said, um, and, and we've discussed uh, with, with the town before in these meetings that uh, it, it, it's definitely a countywide problem. It's not unique to the town of Patterson. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, increased requirements and, and decreased staffing on both the EMS side and the fire side. We feel that this is probably the most uh, cost-effective uh, proposal um, to provide for both fire and EMS supplemental staffing um, at, at as a, a reduced cost as possible. So. Yeah, well, thank you, Matt. Well, uh, like I said, you're giving us a lot to think about. Thank you. Guys, there with the Plenty Lake Fire Department. Uh, I just want to make the board aware that we've heard Matt's proposal, we've read Matt's proposal, and right now our focus on is finding coverage for EMS. We don't feel that we need any supplementation in the fire department and fire service yet. We have plenty of mutual aid. We have other agreements that work very well. Um, we're we're solely focusing on the fact that we need EMS coverage. Yesterday, um, we came to you guys at April 30th as our deadline. We realized that there was no way to get a solution in place at that point. So we're doing our best to supply EMS until we come up with a solution. And the best date we were able to come up, with, come up with was probably around July. So we're willing to stay in place, but the town needs to be aware that we can only give what we're already giving and it can't be any more. Sure. But we need to come up with a solid plan. And no disrespect to the Patterson Fire Department, but a half volunteer, half paid thing isn't really gonna be the solution. It might be a very temporary Band-Aid, but we need something, you know, full out 24 seven coverage to cover what the amount of calls that we're doing. We're doing well over, you know, seven, 800 EMS runs a, a, a year, you know, and it's getting to be a little crazy. So we need to come up with a solid plan. And I recommend that Transcare be the solid plan until maybe something goes on board or something gets started. But a 24 seven coverage is, is paramount. And the county is looking at some options. We're well aware we've all discussed them. The options would end up being cheaper on the county level, but putting more responsibility on the actual customer who calls and will be required to bill. So there's some give and take in the uh, you know the different systems. Transcare also has a lot better system status management when it comes to moving vehicles in as they're being used. <coughs> so all that stuff needs to be taken into consideration when we sit down and look at this. I think we first need to come up with a, a solid solution right off the bat, and then we can work towards all the different other options that we have, you know, the Great Swamp Vac, Patterson Vac, whatever we come up with, we can come up with other solutions. But something needs to be done sooner than later because it's getting tougher and tougher for us out there. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda is a public hearing for alternate board members for various town boards. Uh, Michael, would you read the public notice, please? Public notice. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's hereby given that there has been introduced before the Town Board of the Town of Patterson, New York, on March 25, 2015, 
an amendment to Patterson Town Code Chapter 2 entitled Alternate Board Members, which amendment will revise Chapter 2 to provide for the appointment of individuals to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Veteran Memorial Park Advisory Board, or the Putnam Lake Advisory Board that may temporarily serve on the board when regular members of the board may be unavailable. Now, therefore, pursuant to Section 20 of the Municipal Home Rule Law, the Town Board of the Town of Patterson, New York, will hold a public hearing on the aforesaid amendment at the Town Offices, 1142 Route 311, Patterson, New York, on April 22, 2015, at 7 p.m. in the evening of that day, or as soon thereafter as may be held, at which time all persons interested therein shall be heard. The Town Board will make every effort to assure that the hearing is accessible to persons with disabilities. Anyone requiring special assistance and or reasonable accommodations should contact the Town Clerk by order of the Town Board of the Town of Patterson. Okay, basically what this is is legislation to allow uh, various Town Boards to have alternates to the boards so that if there is a time where they need to somebody to sit in, they'll have that option. So if anybody has any questions or would like to make any comments, please come up to the microphone, state your name for the record, and ask your question, make your comment. One at a time, please. <laughs> there you go. Yay, Pat. Yay, Pat. Somebody's got to do it. There you go. <laughs> Pat Flogger, uh, Putnam Lake Park District Advisory Board. Um, a question. This, uh, the number of people on, at, at alternates, how many would there be? Number one. Number two, um, would they be required to attend uh, regular meetings uh, to be up to snuff? I mean, the same sort of requirements that a regular board member would have and then do they have they have full voting privileges I'm assuming in the absence of the full board or is it in the absence of a quorum does the does the law say that they have to attend I thought it was I mean I guess it wouldn't be loud and into your microphone please. does the does the proposed law say that they have to attend would it just be at the discretion of the board if no, they it's, it's at the it's when the event occurs that they would be needed so, so they don't have to go to every single town every single meeting. No, but you would you would hope if they're going to be an alternate, they would follow along right. so that they knew what they were coming to vote. There's some boards where that that may be more applicable than others. Let's say the zoning board of appeals, where you you uh, you have an application that's submitted, you would know pretty soon that there may be a conflict, uh, and at that point, you, you know um, the alternate. But would it be nice? Yes. Is, is it is it mandated? I don't believe it is. Right. And it's just one person. So there would be for a, for even our seven member board, there would be only one alternate. Yes, I believe that's the way it's structured. And then he or she would vote only in the absence of one member, or if in the absence of a quorum. That's a good question. That, that was the, other, the go ahead, Mike. Okay, so um, you know what? That, that is that is a good question. If if um, um, the way it reads is the chair, each board may designate an alternate member to substitute for a member of their board when such member is unable to participate in an application or matter before their respective board. So, so it's that, be. that conflict. Yeah, sitting. basically it's not if somebody can't make a particular meeting, then the alternate sits in and right, votes. And right. it's, so it's only if, if somebody's conf conflicted out. As but I understand it. As required by the chairman or at the invitation of the chair of that board. Well, it's the chair that designates. Uh, it says the chairperson of each board may designate an alternate member to substitute for a member of their board when such member is unable to participate. But Pat, Pat's question, I believe, is let's say, for instance, tonight we can only have two board, two town. It doesn't apply to the town board, but for example, if there are only two town, town board members, would the alternate be entitled to be involved? No. If there is a, a, a member that has a conflict and that, that member is, is then called upon to step in for someone else, then they would be involved, if, if that makes sense to you. So it's not in the absence of a quorum. That's right. It's in the, it's, it's in it's, the, in the, uh, the event that a particular member is unable to participate in an application or a matter. 
because of a conflict it, or not because he or she is on vacation. I don't think it expressly says okay. conflict. It, well, Can no. I just clarify as an author? Sure. Because oh, I did, I did write this. Okay. Um, it's not just a conflict. If well, somebody goes away on vacation, then the chairman could call on somebody to fill the seat. Okay, I'm just reading what it, but. Well, the, again, the way I wrote it, the, okay. way, the, the way the intent okay. is, it's in the absence of a member's ability to participate. Okay. And that's not just a conflict, that's if they're away on vacation, if they've got a prolonged sickness, whatever. Okay, Mike, are you reading that there is a different way, a more clear way of saying that so that the intent is, in, is clear? Um, you know, not, I don't I mean right now, I mean to look at it before. You know, Sean, I, I didn't study it, I know. you know, a great it's length. It's pretty simple. So uh, I, think it, I think it's fine. I, I read it as if, if you're unable to participate or a matter that. Well, there's some discretion in there for the chair there is. as well. Yeah. And Pat, the, the um, adoption of this local law doesn't um, require an alternate member. That's at, the, at your board's discretion. It has been helpful in the past with planning and zoning board over the years. Not many times, but it has come up where there have been conflicts on certain applications where members of uh, boards have, you know, we've used alternates. Well, you've used alternates on planning. Did you have to, uh, did, was there a conflict or what, no, was there a quorum or did you not have? No, I think it was, there was an issue years ago, Rich, you may remember where I think either a zoning member stepped in for the planning <laughs> board as an alternate or vice versa on an application. You're right. You're, you're right. Yeah. Um, so they they're already up on the on the process because the okay. there's a lot of you know a lot of um, overlap between planning and zoning, right. um, and also Mike and I had just noted it looks like planning board was omitted from the local law resolution but was not intended to be. It says uh, zoning and the park boards, but planning is not. Sean, mentioned. that's because we already have the local law. The local law is already applicable to planning board members. It so does. Oh, zoning wasn't in that. No. So oh, I didn't this realize is only that. modifying it for the zoning board and the two I apologize. Boards. Okay. My apology. Pat, do you think that yeah. this would help your board or well, I think uh, just a brief discussion that we had, we were uh, Mike Mike Ericole was here from our board. Uh, we thought it was a good idea. Yeah. Um, my question my last question I think is that um, would this person be then um, uh, apply the uh, interview, the appointed as an alternate, or is it just somebody that the chair calls out of the community last minute? I think it'd be uh, identified. No, you, you would have to designate them in advance. Okay. Right. Yeah. Can't yeah. just be okay. Uh, You're you know, pinch hitting. Come on. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You'll do. Hey, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> You're too smart for that, aren't you? <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? Any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah, a motion to adjourn the public hearing? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, order to the bills, please. I will make a motion to approve abstract number seven, dated April 8th, 2015, in the amount of $824,770.58. So moved. Second. Have a roll call, please. Mr. Burns? Yes. Mr. D'Andriano? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Do you want me to start Charlie's or do you, you want Charles start I don't know about well, chips, but I'll start I'll start up to that if you want. Well I, I just want to say that uh, based on the first item on his agenda, uh, for the twenty second year in a row, Alan Jacknick has received a satisfactory uh, report from Ag and Market. So Congratulations, Alan, well, for a job well done for 22 years, as well as uh, as Brook well Farm. as the municipal shelter uh, Brook Farm received a satisfactory inspection. Yeah, but they've only been doing it for like three years. Well, you know, <laughs> they, don't, they don't come close to his record. But go right ahead. All right. So next item on Charlie's agenda is a, a letter from the Patterson Fire Department uh, appointing new members. Please be advised the following new members have been added to the roles of the membership of the Patterson Volunteer Fire Department: Albert Rossi and Justin Spencer. Uh, also, a letter from Putnam. Uh, did I say that was it's been doors? So, sorry. Uh, the second letter is from Putnam Lake Fire Department, uh, adding Tom Dixon as a member. Okay. Chips, I don't know. Uh, basically, the, uh, the, the state has sent us our authorization, and due to the uh, goodness of their heart, they have been also given us an extra $19,000 this year. So the total chips uh, for this year is $135,353.37. So Russ, spend it well. Uh, Sean. 
Okay, uh, the first item I have is uh, a request for a, a release of a bond for Pond View subdivision based on a recommendation from the planning board. They uh, have bonds that total $1,440,000. The two bonds, uh, the request is to release those bonds. So, so moved. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And uh, after our um, public hearing, thank you, Pat, for the comment, because otherwise it would have been quite boring. Um, I will move the uh, resolution, the final resolution for the uh, local law number one. What are we, April? And we're only on number one, so that's good. Yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of be nice so to get through the whole year without making any more new rules. But, uh, we so I'll introduce this resolution All right. as if it were read. Okay. I yeah. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. And lastly, we have some uh, requests from, first off, from the uh, Park Advisory Board. They would like to hire a head guard, uh, I'm sorry, increase the salary of the head guard, Robert Zaharchuk, to $16 an hour. It's a 45 cent an hour raise. He comes highly recommended with lots of years of experience. And uh, that's the recommendation from the Park Advisory Board and the Chair, Carrie Weisnacker. So I'm going to move that uh, request. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And we also have a request from the Park Advisory Board to hire their lifeguards for the Patterson Veterans Memorial Park. We have, uh, as previously mentioned, Robert uh, Zaharchuk, who will be um, one of their head lifeguards, as well as Nicholas Booth, uh, James O'Connell, Sam Callahan, Chris Ravo, Katie Leonard, Rob Constantino, Michael Vizella, Thomas Hawney, Matthew Hawney, and Hannah Burns. Woohoo! Yeah. No, we're asking for money for movie night. Although I note that Hannah is the lowest paid on the list. That's okay. But, she's on the list. Uh, That's she's good. on the list, so I'll move that uh, request. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Do I have to abstain <laughs> as to Hannah? I don't think I, so. I don't think so. I think you're okay. I, I, I think Unless you're we're having really discussion and we want to double her salary. Else, but, uh, That's it. Okay. Uh, first item on my agenda is local uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. Well, we have any number of suggestions for legislation for the uh, state senate to uh, move on. Uh, that's not exactly what this request is about. We have a letter from our senator. If we need any general housekeeping, I've checked with all departments. At this time, we do not, so there's no action to be taken on that. Rental registration law. This has been kind of hanging around for a while now. We have a memo that goes back quite a ways that uh, basically questions whether our rental registration law is viable the way it's currently uh, written. It basically uh, requires that uh, before you can get a rental registration approval that the town has to do an inspection that's been held by the courts to be illegal. Uh, I have some questions. I understand the Fourth Amendment and that type of thing, but at the same time it, I have concerns that you know, Councillor, if the town is, is going to say it's okay to have a rental registration, but yet we can't go in and do an inspection for safety purposes and make sure the smoke detectors, proper egress, et cetera, et cetera, does, does the court ruling alleviate us from the responsibility if something happens and there's a fire or something and somebody doesn't get out? Uh -huh. I mean, that's really our concern. Oh, yeah. concern. Yeah. Because a lot of people have put in apartments you know, they're in a basement or something where there's no way to get out. If there was a fire, there's only one egress. The windows don't meet code requirements for escape windows. Uh, some of them don't have smoke detectors or CO detectors. And uh, that was our primary principal concern because the town is essentially legitimizing these apartments. And if we're going to tax somebody for it, you know, if something happens, uh, you know, I don't want a lawyer coming back at us and saying, hey, you know, you guys said it was a legal apartment, it was legitimate and uh, didn't meet code, somebody died in the fire, now you're getting sued. I, my concern hasn't changed. I still see it as a safety issue, but the courts have held that you can't require an inspection, so. Well, without a warrant. I, I think you'd be able to get a warrant. Well, I don't see where the town's gonna wanna get a warrant for each and every one of these. There's over 200 of them in the town that I'm aware of. Of the so ones who have signed up. that number, Cheryl. So, oh, the, hi, Bob. Are the ones who have signed up, who are they generally refusing an inspection, or is what's well, the? Uh, as of right now, we have 168. Have you had any, any, any problems with people refusing inspection? No, most actually they do allow us to come in and inspect, and uh, half to two thirds of the time, actually, we're going back for a re-inspection. No, actually, we're funding it. 
Well, again, I mean, I think that's the principal concern is to make sure that these you know, these are safe for habitation. That somebody's not just getting stuck in a basement off a boiler room or something where there's only one way in and out and maybe no windows at all. Well, that's the whole thing is too is you got to have a proper ingress. We always put sure, windows. sure. Um, but also, I know Village of Brewster. I'm not too familiar with you know. I'm just getting to that. They don't do a rental registration. They say they veer away from the rental registration. They do a property registration. So any commercial and residential, you have to register. And what that actually does is you get a, a form and states what is my inventory. And what that actually does, it actually now it gives up the assessor part too. And a lot of times they'll disclose stuff that you know they're not even realizing that they're disclosing. I have four bedrooms. And it's like no, you have three. You know, so all of a sudden it could be actually beneficial for you know assessment and also for building. I, I know in, in Brewster, I just. I had an interaction with the village of Brewster where the, the um, uh, a client of mine was issued an appearance ticket for not permitting the building inspector access, and we're we're disputing this issue right now whether they they legitimately can have access uh, without a search warrant. So um, the um, I'll have an well, that's that's where where we make reference in the memo. That's where that's. I, I, I'm, I called the search warrant before, but that's really what you're looking for is administrative warrants. Well, I, I, the only reason I bring this up is because I was going through files of stuff that, you know, I, I, I keep things that eventually I work my way back around to. And I looked at this and I went, you know, this has been hanging around for quite a while and it hasn't been addressed in probably almost a year. Yeah. So thought being that if, if we are out of compliance we need to get into compliance so I would just ask that you know Bob and you and Richie uh, maybe sit down and go we already, through. We already hashed this out. You've got, well, you've the, got the amendments to the law. I know that. I, I this, There's a red line version in here and etc. The only question was is Bob raised some a point about is there a better way to do this? So I think that's the only. Well, it's also a possibility for this rental, this resident uh, registration is basically seeing what our inventory is anyway. You know, that's, that could be also the other option of it, too. All right, well then, uh, then we can adopt, we can revamp the law, get that settled, and then we can look at other options. I, I, the only other option you've got that I'm aware of is if we put something in there that the property owners are self-certified. Right. If, if they don't allow the in-home in -home inspection that they self-certify. Well, does that... We, we, pitched that uh, what a year ago when we proposed the changes to the law and, and you know, nobody really wanted to do the self-certification. Does that satisfy the court if they have an opt-out provision? Well, well if we put an opt-out provision in saying you self-certify or submit to an inspection, does that satisfy the court? Well, we can't force the submittal to the inspection, but we can give them. We can say you can self you can self. -certify. Right, but if they choose not to do either, well, if they if they if they. Uh, so then we'd be left to they go choose, to get a, if they get a warrant. Not to self -certify, they don't get the permit. Right, right. Or we have to get a warrant or an administrative. But we can't get the administrative warrant without reasonable cause. So basically, though, that at least at that point, if they self certify, then the liability's on them. Yeah, and that's uh, um, you guys have looked at the the you know the special context about the liability. So it, you know it doesn't attach right away. Even though you guys may regulate the, the you know, the, the registration of the apartments, uh, there's there's a particular point where the liability attaches for the municipality. Um, but but if they're not going to self-certify and then they don't have a, a permit, then I, I think you guys have done what you what you intended to do. You know, and if you have to right. take it a step further, then you, you you make the application for the administrative permit. Because the burden isn't as high as a, the the, uh, the search warrant. No, absolutely not. It's much, much lower. lower. All right. Well, then uh, I think we can move forward on this, and we'll, we'll set it up for. We brought it up. Do you want to? Do you want to talk about doing self certification? Do you? Do you want yeah, to I, I think, think we have to have okay. some methodology to protect the town. If if we if we can't actually go in and do an inspection, or somebody refuses an inspection. There's got to be a way to protect the town to say, okay, look, if something does happen, um, you know, I mean, it's to me, I'm concerned that you know the fire department's not going to have the information they need. We're not going to have the ability to go in and inspect to make sure it's safe for somebody to even be in there. So, 
you know, I just want to make sure the town's protected in this and uh, to the best of our ability. Matt? Yeah, uh, Matt Spender, Chief of Patterson Fire Department. I was wondering if you could just clarify for us um, any, anything over two apartments is uh, considered a multiple dwelling, correct? Because, uh, you know, we just had a fire on First Street uh, last week. Technically, the building had three apartments. It's considered a multiple dwelling. It should be inspected uh, at least annually. Um, and, you know, to our knowledge, there was not one smoke detector in the entire building. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we wouldn't have access to the apartments anyway for inspection, but even the common areas, uh, not one working smoke detector around the entire building. And, and fortunately, the people were still somewhat awake uh, and smelled the fire uh, before uh, it, it started to really extend into the building. But I'm not sure that that building is uh, certainly not unique among the town. Uh, and, and, you know, we need to have some method by which these buildings are being inspected on at least an annual basis to protect the residents and to protect, the, protect us. Right. On a rental registration, we did every three years. And he wasn't actually certified. He was served a notice of violation. But that this apartment? Pardon? This apartment? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Every three years, actually, we do a rental registration. He was, actually he was served a notice of violation just recently? Yeah, right. That was brought up after the fire. Correct. Yeah. Um, then it's a lot of times you're going to find these things. There's a lot of, I would suggest there's probably somewhere a couple hundred in the town that are registered. There's probably a couple hundred that, that are illegal. They need to be, yeah. And uh, you know, we have no idea how safe they are or aren't. Um, but basically what we've done is we've worked off of the assessor's records and the building department's records to try and figure out to the best we can who has apartments. But, you know, you send out a mailer, people don't fess up. There's only so much you can do. But that, that puts the responsibility and the onus back on them. Not that, that that's the only issue here. You know, I don't want to see anybody get hurt in a fire or get trapped in a building where they can't get out simply because somebody wanted to make a few bucks. But uh, we'll continue to do the best we can. We'll bring this up and uh, we'll move it forward to get the, the law amended and uh, we'll do the, uh, add the opt-out provision and we'll go from there. That'll be local law number two. Hot dog. Uh, PSSI proposal, I uh, brought this up last week quickly. We had asked for comments from various entities. I'm still <laughs> waiting for comments from a couple of folks. Uh, Jamie, thank you. I appreciate your input. Matt, same thing. Um, but I'm going to table this because I still want to hear from our fire code inspector and a few other folks. So, uh, Low SAP settlement update. Counselor, you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, from uh, where we had last left off last Friday, uh, I'm sorry, two two Wednesdays ago, uh, I prepared a, uh, a resolution for consideration for the board to uh, uh, authorize the uh, 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 essentially settlement of the claim or payment of, of the retrospective post entitlement accrual um, benefits and and. Just a, a quick recap on, on how that all works again. Uh, it's, it's very simple. The, the plan says after age 65, even if you are accruing. Can you speak in? I don't think people can hear you. Sure. Um, the way our, our length of service awards program operates, that, that program is a, a, a benefit program for volunteers in each of the departments. That. Can you get closer? Now? People are here. Okay. So the board is considering a uh, a resolution that that uh, uh, I drafted in connection with uh, the length of service awards program uh, to authorize the payment of retrospective post entitlement ben benefits. Currently, our plan provides that after age 65, you're no longer entitled, that, that's entitlement age, when you're in, entitled to start collecting benefits under the plan. If you're an active volunteer firefighter um, and you're not 100% vested, you cannot vest 100% because you're cut off at age 65. 
So it, hypothetically, if it takes 30 years to vest, and at age 65, you have 25 years in the department, you're foreclosed from those five extra years. In 2006, the uh, EEOC brought a litigation uh, against a number of uh, volunteer fire departments in the, uh, I'm sorry, municipalities in the state of New York, uh, claiming age discrimination and was successful. That this, this uh, cutoff, entitlement age, preventing people from fully vesting is uh, essentially violates the US code or the age discrimination prevention provisions of the United States code. Uh, in, in response to that, departments over time have amended their length of service awards program to keep entitlement age at whatever that age is determined to be. Some departments have 60, some have 62, some have 65. Uh, but they've amended the plan to say that that you're not cut off as long as you're providing uh, active service, as that's defined under the general municipal law. There's a whole criteria of what, what is used to be determined, what is active to reach your points, your state points. You can continue until you fully vest. Um, for the, uh, uh, the, the town of Patterson Town Board, it's been put on notice of the EEOC, EEOC claim and that there have been members of the departments who have in fact been cut off from fully vesting because of the, the, uh, the age. So we have prepared a uh, resolution that would authorize the town board to compensate those uh, members of the departments who were cut off but who had reached their, their uh, um, you know, provided their active service uh, to, uh, uh, to the departments. We, we were provided, um, information from the plan uh, administrator or the plan provider, which is uh, a company by the name of VFIS. That's the plan that provides these benefits that the town board pays for. So the resolution authorizes the town board to purchase those post entitlement benefits, essentially pay v VFIS what it needs to pay in order to compensate the members who have been um, uh, affected by by the um, uh, the cutoff in the plan, and and that's what this does. Uh, further to the discussion at the last town board meeting, I, I talked to Joe Visconti at, at um, uh, our he, he's essentially the broker for our plan and VFIS. I confirmed that we can authorize and direct them to to do that, um, and that our resolution would be satisfactory to. To, uh, to cover that, to give them the authority that they need to uh, um, uh, facilitate that. And that, that's what's before the town board this evening. All right, I only have one question on the resolution. It talks about fully vested after 30 years of active service. I believe our plan is 20 years 20. of active service. Okay. So you want to modify that? Certainly. Um, okay, well then at that this point, if you're satisfied that we can do this <laughs> settlement this way, uh, then I'm gonna move the resolution as written with the one change that uh, vested after 20 years of active service and that uh, other than that I will move the resolution is read so move second all in favor aye any opposed and we're going to continue we're going to go ahead with the referendum to modify the plan yeah I I, I spoke at length uh, this morning again to um, um, to Bill Young who is the attorney for the Association of the Fire Districts. He, he's uh, an author of, of uh, a lot of the legislation that, that's been passed over the last 30 years with regard to uh, the volunteer fire departments and ambulance corps. And uh, I brought to him um, Dave Garwood's position. Dave's at Pinsky's firm. He also represents the Patterson Fire Department. Um, their firm, they speak regularly across New York about fire district law. And they're they, th one of the go-to people. Um, the subject of the discussion was, did that EEOC determination preempt the section of general municipal law that says the method in which your plan is adopted must be used, must be the same method in which you either change or eliminate the plan. And that, that's what calls for the referendum. Okay. So the discussion that we had was, was the common sense one, which was, well, what do you do if you go to referendum and it fails? Do you right. stay being in a discriminatory situation? Right. And and I, I said, what what do what do we do? You know, I said I I, I, we, I looked at the preemption issue. 
um, preemption seems to be, it, it appears that we need something to be more on point to, to facilitate the preemption. Um, it appears that worst case scenario is that if you don't have the referendum, then uh, it's likely that you're going to be audited by the controller. Um, or if your audit, in, independent audit discloses it, then, then the controller would be on notice. They would ding you and then have you sent, have request that you guys go to a referendum. I called the controller's office. There's counsel there. Um, I submitted a, a, a request for them to render an opinion back to us to tell us exactly what we should do. Because it, it, I, in, in speaking to the counsel at the controller's office, the, the attorney that I talked to, he was familiar with the issue. He knows we're in a catch-22. The legislature hasn't fixed it yet. But if they're not going to audit us, then um, if they've determined collectively across the board that you're not going to be subject to an audit for not having a referendum, then I don't want the town to go out to a referendum if you don't have to. Um, What's the time frame for getting that back as opposed to when we have to do the referendum? Oh, yeah, we, 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 I, I should hear back within the next week on that question. And then if we went out to referendum, it would be with your, your, your general election. You wouldn't have to have a special election. Okay. So we have some time. But I'm yeah, I, I just don't want to get jammed up with the EEOC because if there's in the future, if there's a claim. Right. And and someone goes and files agreements with the EEOC. Well, now you're they can't. Well, at least we've taken steps to correct the, the problem. Right. So, so we've right. addressed the financial inequity by ref, by by our resolution. Mm -hmm. Right. The long term referendum or change to the plan may have to be a referendum. That's the issue. Yeah, but That's all this it. is going to do right now is satisfy those that have been, been aggrieved. Been aggrieved. Right. But in the future, if there are aggrieved parties, when we can still be in gotcha. the same situation. So. It's best we get the plan amended. All right, so uh, motion been made, seconded. I think we all voted, so we can move on. Kevin? Well, quick update. Penguins 1, Rangers 0. Sorry. <laughs> but <clears throat> followed by that, a letter from an attorney. Uh, I have a letter from Mr. McCormick. As you may recall, there was an image that was used by the Patterson Rec Center on their website. We received a notice of a cease and desist notice, and um, they said that the, the uh, photo had been copyrighted, and they asked us to take it down. We promptly did. Uh, they wrote to us previously for requesting a statutory settlement. There are statutory damages for copyright infringement. Uh, we were, I think I was skeptical that this would ever come back to, and just said, let's do nothing and wait and see. What was that, six months ago? Yeah. So, um, probably more than that. so basically it came up on this guy's diary again. He realized we hadn't sent him any cash, so he sent us another letter. So it's from Mr. McCormick in, uh, of Intellectual Property and Business Law in uh, Seattle, Seattle, Washington. Mm -hmm. So my guess is this is his big client, and he sends about 1,000 of these a month to, uh, to make money. I, I guess the question is, do we do nothing again and wait to see if he files suit? Uh, Don had said the statutory damages start, I think, at $200. $200. We could write him back and offer $200. Um, the only question I had, and I never really got a clear answer, was whether or not that would be conditioned upon demonstrating that the photo was, in fact, copyrighted. Yeah, Don, I, I spoke to Don before the meeting. He, he's asked him to provide, provide us that? with the copyright. Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, the letter says, yeah, we, we, we do have that right. We can yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, there's no. It's like a circular argument. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, he's. It's, He's asking for $910, he'll take 445 The question is, do we offer him anything or $200 and get a release, or do we just wait for the next letter of the lawsuit to come in? Well, I, I think that uh, to write him back and tell him that, you know, we want some definitive proof that, that he even, that A, that, that the piece in question was copyrighted, and right. and, and that uh, this, this group or organization is entitled to compensation from it. Right. We don't know if they're actually holding the copyright or so, not. So can you write that letter and just say that, you know, upon we will take no action until we receive proof of copyright? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Next item on my agenda is a recreation request. I have a memorandum from Bat Chabarro regarding first aid and CPR training. Angel Care Safety will providing American Safety and Health Institute's uh, wilderness first aid training approximately 12 hours and CPR for professional rescuers approximately six hours. The cost for first aid training is $100 a person. This training is included in the 2015 budget line is responding to emergencies. No more than four persons will take the wilderness training. The CPR uh, pro class is provided to the town at no cost. I'm anticipating 10 employees will take this training. Uh, he's requesting approval for staff members to complete the mandatory first aid and CPR training uh, and be compensated for the training time. So I'll make a motion to approve 
the attendance of up to 10 employees uh, for the CPR class and up to four employees for the wilderness first aid training uh, at comp at, uh, as compensated. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, next item is just, uh, I guess this is more just an FYI, that the following prices will be effect for the upcoming sessions offered by the Rec Center. Uh, gu guitar tenor Center, $80 per child. Tumble Time, $80 per child. Tag Sale Vendor Space, $25 for space. Um, camp is $160 a week, $150 for each additional week. Uh, flag Football is $160. Lego Camp is $160. Uh, so that and before camps and after camps are fifty dollars per child or fifteen dollars per day, and there's also a pre-K camp. So I know they're very valuable programs, and they are all accounted for in the budget. So I think it's just more FYI. I don't think we're approving anything. So well, certainly, Ed, I checked, are we? And, and tumble time is out for you and me. What? I, I think we're just a okay, tad right. over the age limit. So do we make a motion approving these? Uh, sure. sure. All right, so I'll make a motion approving the recommended uh, guidelines for program prices for uh, those various camps as read. And I should note that there are discounts if you are a rec member fee or if you're uh, doing multiple weeks at the camp. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Good. Item C, sale of surplus items. Uh, we re, uh, Highway had retained AAR auctions to uh, sell some ex some surplus property. Actually, was it Highway? I guess it was townwide. It wasn't just Highway. Uh, so there were, I guess, six lots that were uh, sold uh, for various amounts. Um, they did okay. Some were better than others. Uh, overall, there's a recommendation that we accept the bids as submitted through the AAR auction outcome. Uh, this is from uh, Margo, uh, Russell Voss, Secretary. So I'd make a motion to approve the sale of the six lots that were auctioned off on AAR auctions online as submitted. So moved. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. All right. I have two items to end my agenda. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Next item is actually the... Uh, Park Advisory Board has requested that the Highway Department obtain bids for mulch. Margo made calls around and found that the cheapest mulch was with um, as $20, $20 per yard delivered from JW, JF Walsh Mulch in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Uh, we require 50 yards, and at that rate, they would be waiving the delivery fee. So I make a motion to approve uh, uh, the Park Advisory Board through the Highway Department, I guess, purchasing $1,000 worth of mulch, 50 yards of mulch, uh, to deliver to the park for distribution. So moved. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> last item on my agenda is just an update. I did attend the Scout Blue and Gold Dinner last Saturday, the crossing over uh, from a Weeblow to a Boy Scout. Uh, I was well attended. The sheriff was there. Uh, our county legislator, Jenny Nasserino, was there, and Mary Ellen O'Dell was there. And uh, as a true politician, since I didn't have certificates in hand, I told them that they would be in the mail. It's probably the worst thing that you can hear from a politician, the certificates in the mail. But I would ask our supervisor when I get a list if we could sign the certificates. Well, oh. I just I just want to say that, that, they, that there have always been certificates. Right. There's yeah. been very good about that. However, this year the scouts did didn't not provide us a list of who was crossing over so consequently there were no certificates so it's consequently i had to get up and so say if we, certificates if we in get the a, mail. if we get a list we will send certificates all right if, I will follow if not up. those I will follow up those scouts will get their first taste of how government really truly works <sighs> that is, is all i have on that note so i started with the rangers and i ended with that wow <laughs> how do i top that yeah uh, no I don't know. Maybe we should just, just end it right there. I We're top it by the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, there you go. The, I always get the crappy agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, first item on my agenda is the uh, the bulk service contract for the wastewater treatment plant. I have a memo here from the town planner, Rich Williams. We received the annual quote from the Paul Advance Separation Systems for the Patterson Hamlets wastewater treatment plant's microfiltration unit. Fall service agreement is part of the preventive maintenance program to ensure the plant continues to operate properly. The annual service contract includes a system inspection, annual cleaning, and 24-7 service support. So um, I'd like to make a motion that the contract uh, also he says the board should also note that the microfiltration system is part of the New York City, New York City DP upgrades and it is an eligible expense for partial reimbursement. So we could probably get some money back 
and the cost for this year's annual contract is eleven thousand seven hundred and ninety dollars reflecting a four point two percent increase from the 2014 contract which was eleven thousand three hundred and ten so at this time i'd like to make a motion to approve eleven thousand seven hundred and ninety dollars to uh to uh renew the contract with paul uh, paul services second all in favor aye any opposed next time i have some announcements <clears throat> saturday may 2nd putton county has household hazardous waste collection day at Fawnstock Park, Route 301 in Kent. Items accepted, drain oven cleaners, rug and upholstery cleaners, polishes, waxes, spot removers, oil-based paints, solvents, thinners, wood preservatives, strippers, and so on. Uh, what is not accepted is electronic waste, used oil, latex paint, lead acid batteries, plastic bags, and tires. The, uh, we're also we're all invited to the row of honor kickoff pancake breakfast which is saturday may 16th from nine o'clock to 11 a.m it's at the carmel vfw hall route 52. can't really read this too much but uh eight dollars a person eight dollars a person and all proceeds go towards the traveling vietnam memorial wall and I have to plug my child safety day, which is uh, actually for the people that are here because by the time it airs, it'll be over. But this Sunday, April 26th, at the Putnam Lake VFW, be the child set, our annual, the Chamber, Putton, Patterson Chamber of Commerce annual child safety day. There'll be child fingerprint ID cards, there'll be a car seat check, police canine de demos, fire truck displays by the Putnam Lake Fire Department, as well as um, the ambulance. We also have, uh, the, I also got the Red Cross is coming to do some uh, some emergency preparedness stuff. And we are also having our Putnam Lake Neighborhood Watch is going to be there with some crime prevention, neighborhood watch information, a sign-up sheet, some information if, if you want to get involved in the Neighborhood Watch, and, and uh, some other attractions. I think the State Police is also bringing their rollover simulator, which cool. is going to be pretty cool, too. So. Uh, the week after that, there's another safety fair. The Children's Expo and Public Safety Fair. It's, it's Saturday, May 2nd at the Donald B. Smith campus on Old Route 6 in Carmel from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And they're not going to have as many nice, cool stuff as us, but they are going to have a helicopter. Um, maybe they'll have to work on that next year. Yeah. But they are going to do as well car seat checks, Operation Safe Child. They'll have fire trucks there as well, food games, live music, and entertainment. Good stuff. Also, this Saturday is the Patterson Militaria and Knife Collection Collector Show at the Patterson Rec Center. It's, it starts at 9 a.m., adults $5, and children under 12 are free. I'd like to make a motion to add um, an item to my agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I have a couple of requisitions from the Putnam Lake <coughs> Park Advisory Board. Um, <coughs> I have a proposal for uh, swim lessons for an instructor, Ann Krupenny, okay, and swim lessons uh, for an assistant to be determined to total for the season $1,474. Uh, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, next one is for the 2015 softball budget. Uh, they're requesting. Uh, I guess uh, six thousand eight hundred and twenty-one dollars. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And they also are asking or requesting to purchase a lifeguard chair, a large uh, lifeguard chair. Two lifeguard. Chairs. Two lifeguard chairs. Sorry. Um, they are eight hundred twenty-five dollars each. Okay, that's the lowest bid. They had three three prices here uh, from the lifeguard store. It was the lowest bid here. The next one with the other two were $949.69, $968, and the total cost, uh, make a motion to approve $1,650 for two lifeguard chairs. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That's all I have. Well, other business. I think we got it all. Mike, can we go back to the fire department new members? I think you guys have to approve the, the new members. Oh, I thought we just had to announce it. But if you'd say so. Yeah, a simple motion would, would, uh, would I'll do make, it. I'll make a motion to approve the Putnam Lake and Patterson Fire Department new members uh, as read. So, so moved. Second. Great. 
Is that a simple motion and uh, simple enough? As long as you vote, it's good. Well, we're getting there. <laughs> Just want to make sure it's simple it enough. It is. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Any opposed? Is that it? That's it. Okay. Favorite part of the meeting, public recognition. Does any member of the public wish to be recognized at this time? I would hope we wouldn't. Uh... You've already been up, Pat. Come on. Oh, all right. Hey, guys. We're going to sell tickets next time. Um, I, I, three things, uh, all having to do with the Putnam Lake Park District. Uh, the softball uh, league is, it should be noted, is a self-supporting league as it has been for many, many years. Uh, this was just an expense item. The income item is 11000 Their actual expenses are about $6,800. Uh, the rest goes towards maintenance uh, of the field, uh, mowing, dumpsters, pour sand, stuff like that. So things that we would have to pay for out of the uh, tax, uh, the, the park district tax, were it not for the league participating. And it went well last year, didn't it? Yes. Right? Yes, it did very well. Um, I uh, have one announcement uh, for those of you on the board who attend our meetings. I apologize for some of the confusion we've had in the past few months. We have now straightened it out. Our public meeting, uh, the first meeting of the month, will be the first Thursday, and it will be upstairs in the meeting room at the uh, like the fire department. Um, the uh, third Thursday will be at the New Life Church as <coughs> It's actually better because I, I can make them again. I couldn't make Good. I couldn't make those Tuesday nights. Good. So I okay. could. And I have some wonderful news that um, I shared last week with Mike. Um, uh, we are delighted to announce that as of tomorrow at five o'clock, the Patterson Little League will be returning to Memorial Field in Putnam Lake. Good. Uh, so we're yes, thank you. Okay, good. Like you're saying, that, thank goodness it's been a long time. Uh, their first, this is a practice session tomorrow, and then they will be, uh, their games, we don't know the schedule yet, uh, but they will, we are looking at probably two games, I think we talked about it Tuesday evening and hopefully it's Saturday. So we welcome everybody in town to come and see them play on our field. Thank you. Nice. Thanks. Thank you. Good. That's good. Nice. My name is Nancy Cowpell, I'm a Patterson resident. I just have two questions. Um, LOSAP, is there any kind of financial um, impact that that's going to have on the town? Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, okay. It's fairly substantial impact. Cur well, currently, uh, the Length of Service Awards program is uh, approximately $140,000 a year. This will impact the budget by about $30,000 a year for approximately four years to get caught up. So our, the, currently the plan is funded at about 85%. This will take it down to about 70, I think three or 4% funding. And then it has to be paid back over a period of time. Uh, the, the total compensation for the individuals involved, I believe is, is close to, is right around six figures. Six figures per individual? No, 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 no. total. 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 How many, how many uh, I believe it's <coughs> seven or eight. Well, it's unfortunately uh, a lot of them were locked out very, very early in the process. Uh, some of them were only one or two years, and uh, Ed Setafani in particular, uh, he was I think 62 or three when the program was implemented, and uh, he had a two two years. Then he was automatically bounced out, but he's now in his 80s and he's still making his points. Wow. So, hmm. oh yeah, no, I did. Ed, Ed is amazing. I mean, he is a absolute phenom in my book. Uh, he's a World War II veteran. He probably makes as many calls as anybody at the firehouse, and he's been active in the fire police since uh, there were fire police. <laughs> huh. Okay, I, I don't know who the people are, but I just feel that uh, you know, six figures and five people, six people, or when you said it's quite a bit of money. It is. Yeah. That was my my first question because money wasn't mentioned. And the other was Pete. You said something about an instructor going for lessons. No, what it's that? giving the lessons. Giving They're lessons. They're hiring an instructor. Giving yeah, put them like. Okay, got it. Yeah. It sounded like you were were paying an instructor to take to lessons. take lessons. Oh, oh no, no. Okay. I was going to correct it, but I thought everybody got the. No, they didn't get it. Yeah. I didn't get it. That's all right. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else? 
Sorry, this couldn't have been more entertaining. But uh, motion to adjourn. It happens. Is there Make a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.